Hello, this is a brief lecture on ET tubes and their presentation in ICU chest films. This is our disclaimer. ET tubes are common in the ICU. They're often placed to protect or control the airway in patients who are comatose or non-responsive and this provides an avenue of oxygenation or ventilation in these patients. Chest x-rays are often done after the placement of an ET tube. This is to verif verify placement but also rule out any iatrogenic complications. Now, verifying placement is important because 15 percent of ET tubes may be malpositioned when placed by non-experienced providers. We'll cover some of the basic airway anatomy, trachea, the main bronchi, and the carina. On the left is a computerized diagram of these structures, and on the right is a chest film, which is normal. Start with the trachea on the computerized diagram. It runs from superior to inferior. And on the chest film we see it as a hypodense column or a cylindrical lucency in the midline, running again from superior to inferior. In the left main bronchus, and seen on the chest film, it's a curved hypodense column, curves into the left lung field, as shown here, and the right main stem bronchus. And on the chest film, it also appears as a curving hypodense column, although in this example it's not quite as visible as on some other films you may see. And the carina, approximately located here on the chest film. This is a cartilaginous structure which runs from anterior to posterior and divides the trachea into the left and right main stem bronchus. This is a picture of an endotracheal tube. You can see it's a curved tube. It's inserted through the oral cavity and into the airway. It's visualized to go through the vocal cords. After placed, the balloon cuff is inflated as is seen in the second picture. This balloon cuff holds the ET tube in the proper position once it's been placed. Here's a close-up view of the balloon cuff. You can also see the radiodense stripe running down the midline of the tube. This helps to differentiate the ET tube from other structures on a chest x-ray. Again, a chest x-ray is often taken to verify placement after the ET tube has been placed. You want to verify that the ET tube is within the trachea. To do that, you're just going to want to see that the ET tube overlies the hypodense column of the trachea. And you're also going to want to verify that the tip of the ET tube is within 5 to 7 centimeters of the carina. Sometimes the carina is not visible in a chest film. You can approximate its location by looking for the T5, T6, and the T6, T7 disc spaces. We'll quickly show you how to estimate the location of the carina. On the left in the computerized diagram, you see highlighted in blue is the T1 vertebra body. And this reminds us that the T1 vertebra body attaches to the first rib. The first rib attaches to the superior aspect of the T1 vertebra body. Using this information, we can find the vertebral bodies below T1. So here's a normal chest film again. We can see the left and right main stem bronchi and estimate the carina that way. If this wasn't immediately visible, we could go to look for the first rib anteriorly and then find the second rib. Using the second rib, we follow back to find T2 and then can't down the vertebral bodies, T3 and T4, T5, 6, and 7. That way we've localized the T5, T6, and the T6, T7 disc spaces. And as we see in this example, the carina does indeed lay in an approximate position of the T5, T6, or T6, T7 disc spaces. Let's do some practice cases now. This patient's a three-year-old female who had a fall from a height of three stories. There's white out of the left hemithorax, and you can see that there's an ET tube in the trachea. You can see the radiodense stripe going from superior to inferior with a slight bend towards the right side. You also notice that the tube appears to be slightly to the left of midline. This could represent shift of mediastinal structures. And when we estimate the space of the carina in the T5, T6 this space, we can see that the tip 
of the ET tube is within the vicinity of the proximate location of the carina. All this information put together is concerning for a right main stem bronchus intubation. In a right stem, a right main stem bronchus intubation, the ET tube will follow the course of the right main stem, and we may see a pacification of the contralateral lung field. That's due to atelectasis most likely, although in a case such as this, you'd have to be concerned for hemothorax due to trauma. In atelectasis, although not always seen, it can be seen in a main stem bronchus intubation. It's due to collapse of the contralateral lung. You may also see elevation of that diaphragm, the contralateral diaphragm. And you can see mediastinal, mediastinal shift towards the collapsed lung. So our second case, a 75-year-old male who was intubated following cardiac arrest. We can see an ET tube here with the radiodense stripe. Again, it's curving to the right, so we may initially think that this could be a uh, main stem bronchus intubation. However, we notice that there is a secondary hypodense column superior to the ET tube that appears to be separate from the ET tube. And this would be the right main stem bronchus. So then the question is, where is the ET tube? We can also see that there is a oval hypodensity near the tip of the ET tube. This, of course, represents the cuff. And we see what's an enteric tube, or it may perhaps a Dobhoff tube, next to the ET tube and appears to terminate at the cuff. We may also see distended stomach here. All this information taken together is concerning for an esophageal intubation. In an esophageal intubation, the ET tube won't follow the airway. You may see that secondary hypodense column, which would actually represent the trachea, while the ET tube uh, would be in the esophagus. And you can see in a distended stomach, if they've begun ventilating and air has been forced into the GI tract. Our third case is a 35-year-old female with no further history provided. Again, we see an ET tube and a radiodense stripe. This time we see a curve to the left without any of the other signs of esophageal intubation concerning here for a left main stem bronchus intubation. In this case it's just presented to recognize that a left main stem bronchus intubation is possible while the right main stem bronchus may be more likely. There are other iatrogenic complications that can be ruled out with a chest film. An ET tube cuff that is overinflated can cause damage to the airway. This is called tracheomalacia. You can also get barotrauma. Here's an example of ET cuff overinflation, overdistension. We see with the two arrows, the thin arrows, they point at the cuff, and the singular thick arrow points at the ET tube tip. One rule of thumb is that if the cuff is 1.5 times the width of the trachea, the potential for trauma to the airway exists. And in this case, you can estimate that the cuff is at least 1.5 times the width of the trachea, and maybe slightly more. So in this case, the ET tube appears to be too high in the airway, and the cuff appears to be overinflated. So this is a 65-year-old gentleman who was admitted with tachypnea and tachycardia. This is his admission chest x-ray. We notice that there is no ET tube. This chest x-ray prompted a follow-up CT that was highly suspicious for PCP pneumonia. He was admitted for that and treated. On day six, he had a second chest x-ray done. This was following an ET tube placement. We can see the ET tube in the trachea, but one of the things that stands out initially is this hypodense outline of the mediastinal structure, the left heart border, and also these hypodense lines indicating subcutaneous emphysema in the neck. This is a form of barotrauma. This is pneumomediastinum. 
Again, we saw a hypodense outline of the mediastinal structures. Specifically, we saw an outline of the left heart border. We also saw subcutaneous emphysema. We saw it in the neck uh, bilaterally. Again on day six, a second chest x-ray that day was performed. This was for worsening respiratory distress. We can see the ET tube is still in the trachea. When we look at the mediastinal structure, we see that the pneumomediastinum appears to be resolving, although not completely resolved. We continue to see subcutaneous emphysema in the soft tissue of the neck bilaterally. Again, potentially resolving. We take a look at the left lung field, however, and we'll improve the brightness on this film. We can see that the vascular structures of the lung do not extend completely to the chest wall, and there is a uh, hypodense area in the apical lung field against the slightly more dense lung. This produces an edge, which is seen here. It continues around the lung field and continues inferiorly and is seen here. This represents, of course, a pneumothorax. This is, of course, pneumothorax. This is a complication of ET2 placement and represents barotrauma. The pulmonary vasculature can be seen not extending all the way to the chest wall, and you can see that edge which is produced by the empty thorax against the slightly more dense lung. So again, ET2 is very common in the ICU. The chest x-ray is used to verify placement. You want to verify that the tip is within 5 to 7 centimeters of the carina, and the carina can be estimated by finding the T5, T6, and the T6, T7 disc spaces. You also want to rule out other complications such as overextension of the cuff and barotrauma as shown in previous examples.